I'm preaching a message here today that is, uh, I want to speak to the church that I pastor, the church that God gave me to lead. I want to speak to you like leaders today. Is that okay? And then, um, and so if you have little kids and you think that, oh, because he's going to get a little serious. I'm getting a little serious today. I'm going to get more serious because we have to. Um, and then I'm going to try and make it light. But at the same time, there's no um, soft serving some things. And so I just want us to pray. This Holy Spirit touches us and we, we hear from him today. Um, thank you. Thank you for allowing me to do that. Can we give the worship team a hand? Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Amen. I want you to open your Bibles and have them ready in Matthew chapter 7 and go to verse 24. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. And as you are turning your Bibles there, um, um, how many of you are in the military, you had a parent in the military, you're a child of someone in the military, you make your living off of what happens with our military bases, somehow, some way you are affected by our military, would you go ahead and raise your hand? Praise God, right on. Can we thank God for our military, everybody? That's awesome. That was about like 60% of the hands that just went up. Um, if you saw what happened just this past, just yesterday with the attack of Iran on um, the Middle East region of Israel, during that, we all saw these things brewing, happening, and now I didn't, I didn't, nobody predicted, I didn't predict when it was going to happen. I just felt like, this is, this is a powder keg. It's been like that for years. Of course, it heated up when we had that, when, when Israel, Gaza, well, actually when Hamas broke through Gaza into Israel, and then all of that began to be stirred up, and here we are. You have the proxy war being put on by Iran. Um, you have Hezbollah, Hamas and the Houthis, and you have all of this situation, and so why am I bringing it up? Because it is important to us, not because only because of Israel's the holy land, of course it is, but not only because of that, but because it affects so many of us in this room, that you are in the military, you are benefit from the military, you are working in the military, you work on a base or whatever it is, every single one of us eventually will be affected by any kind of war or conflict that America has to enter into because of our treaties with NATO or because we stand with Israel militarily, uh, whatever is going on, we are all affected. We have bases here. We're going to all be affected by a war that continues to grow. So my prayer is that this war de-escalates so that there is peace and stability in that region so that we would have peace and stability in our lives as well and that lives would be saved there as well, that people wouldn't perish, that you wouldn't have death that's going on in the Middle East. We're talking about people wherever they are, whoever they are, we want God to move in their lives and to save people because the Bible says in Second Peter that God is not willing that anyone would perish, but all would come to repentance. Amen? So when you see what's happening, and sometimes most people, or not most, I'm not going to say most people, just for me, I, I know I have to address it. I know I have to say it. It doesn't have to be the focal point of my sermon, but it can be an area of, that we have to touch upon because so many people's lives can be affected, especially us. Sometimes you think that you're in Hawaii. Oh, we're safe. <laughs> well, actually, we have a lot of bases here. We are safe, but at the same time, that might make us a target, perhaps. And so when you realize now more than ever before that God has picked us and chosen us to live in such a time as this one versus another time where we could have been living in and God could have raised us up in those times, but he brought us here for such a time as this. This is where I live. I live in Hawaii. I ain't going nowhere. You know what I'm talking about? I live here and I'll be here until the day I die or until Jesus raptures his church and we win. Either way, can I get an amen? <laughs> Ultimately, right? So when you have this attack, what now all of a sudden, what, we, what we're going through is, gosh, I have so many areas that I, 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 that I, I want to touch on, but I want to tell you that one of the biggest things that we have to understand is that we are going through a time in society that society and in the world, and not just in the world, but even in our lives. I want you to parallel what's going on in the world and what's going on in our lives. That now what we have is we have the, the challenge of an even greater war, possibility of war down the road. Now, I'm not preaching to stir up any kind of fear. I'm not that, that person. I don't want to do that. But what I want to do is bring the, the issue to the forefront so that we can have awareness, so that we can have faith. Somebody say amen. So as I began to look at this, I realized that we're living in a time in society or in America where we're not as strong as we used to be. We're not as strong as we used to be. We, in fact, we've, they've, I feel like the enemy has weakened us from the inside, and now we all of a sudden we are vulnerable from the outside. 
We've got over 2 million people, I think I said this last week, that have poured into the southern border that we can't necessarily account for, 2 million people, and who tag team along with that. I want to come to America. If I lived in another country, I would love to live in America, right? I would love to live in America, but I have to go the right way, the way that my grandparents did when they came, and your great-grandparents might have when they came, and I know everybody wants to be here, but you can't just let everybody in because now you don't know what you're bringing in as well, whatever other criminal element that could be piggybacking off of the good intentions of people who just want a better life, okay? Yeah, I'm touching every single area today. And I don't mean to, but I think I have to, okay? All right, this is my church, right? Okay, just checking, all right. So, but meanwhile, here in the United States, while that's going on in the Middle East, and they're looking at us, and I think they think that we're weaker, and, they, and, 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 and I'm not gonna say that we are. I think we need to be, did I say that already? Yeah, we are weaker. We need to be stronger. But here in the U.S., what are we doing? We're, we're having arguments about gender dysphoria and pronouns, and we're worried about that while those guys on the other side are hell-bent on killing everybody. And so now when you've got that issue, you've got a weakened America, you've got an emboldened enemy, it has to, you have to realize that you and I must be able to understand and grasp why we need to be supporters of the land of God called Israel. Now you may not support their politics, and I don't know everything about their politics or their policies, but the reason why I stand with them is because what we understand is based upon the word of God. For example, Genesis chapter 13, verse one to three. Here's why. It says, the Lord said to Abraham, leave your native country, your relatives, your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you and I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you, I will make you famous, and those, uh, you will be a blessing to others. So that's me and you, we're the others, we're the Gentiles, right? I will bless those who bless you, I will curse those who treat you with contempt, right? And all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. Why? Because the covenant that God made with Abraham, that's why. Here, let me give you another reason. Why? Because we are Gentiles, and every ethnicity, Every ethnicity is and given the chance to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior because the Bible says every knee shall bow and every tongue, every language shall confess that Jesus is Lord. And that includes every knee, every tongue. So who does that include? That includes Arabs. That includes Iranians. Do you know that there's an underground church in Iran, not under, this, under the ground, but an underground church that is believing in Jesus Christ. There's a revival going on in Iran. Of course, they're trying to squash it. Do you know that the Chinese have one of the biggest churches in the world? Not in, not in structure, but in people, in cell churches that meet privately and quietly, and they are being persecuted by their own people and their own government, and they've got to be quiet about them meeting together. And there is a state sponsored church where everything's okay if you go to this state sponsored church but you th there's an underground church and a lot of the church has been forced to go underground in different parts of these worlds do you realize that one of the biggest muslim nations in the world the biggest one is called indonesia but did you know that the biggest churches in the world some of them are in indonesia Christian churches. So the whole concept of us that God is only moving in Western society is not true. He's moving all over the world and even in people that you never thought that he would. Because what? Because we don't hear about it. We just don't, we don't know about it. And I want to bring some awareness to you. My first Lebanese Christian, I didn't even know there was a Lebanese Christian. My first Lebanese Christian friend was my friend Tony Gibran. And I met Tony, I met him in Australia. This guy was tall, like really tall, and the biggest smile, and the greatest guy, and he introduced me to my first flat white, my first coffee, my first cappuccino. Changed my life. I was all, we were drinking Starbucks the whole time, and all of a sudden you drink this flat white, and they do a little fern pattern in it, you know what I'm talking about? It's like, wow, it just, it changes you, anyway. But Tony, and I ate, I ate my first Lebanese meal with Tony in a city called Blacktown in Australia, a, a suburb of Sydney. And I'm eating there, and I can't believe it because this is different to me. This is totally different to me. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm American, but I'm Hawaiian too, but I'm American. I'm, con I'm, I'm not confused. I'm American Hawaiian, and I'm a Christian. <laughs> but my Christianity trumps my culture. It does. It does. It even, it even trumps my, my Americanism. It has to. It has to. It has to. 
So when I began to have my first Lebanese meal, my first time with Tony, I'm sitting there eating lamb, I'm having the time of my life, and there are Muslims in that town, but there are Christians too. And sometimes we think that there is no Christians in a, Mus in, in a Muslim country, and there are, there are. And so when we look at this, but, this, but the West, now let's talk about the West, okay? Because we, the West, why do, I, why do I stand with Israel? Because we, the West, we're part of the West, the United States of America, are a common enemy to Islamist extremists and rogue nations. They don't only want to kill Jews, they want to kill Christians too. Did you know that? Right? And they do. Because they are killing and persecuting, persecuting Jews and Christians. And here's one more. Because Jesus was Jewish. Did you know that? Did you know Jesus? Oh, yeah, of course we knew that. I thought he was a skinny, skinny guy from the 60s with a long beard and it. No, he's Jewish. And guess what? One more. The Bible was written by Jews. So anti-Semitism, the hate of the Jews, cannot be in the church. It cannot be with Christians, okay? Now, I'm going to say one more thing. I don't, I don't know the policy of Netanyahu. I do not know it. I do not know it, but I stand with Israel because of the covenant, and I have, and I want to say, and I've been there, and I've been, I've been there three times. I've been to Bethlehem. I've been there, and I love the country, and I love its people. Now, one more thing, because why? Because evil is overtaking, is trying to overtake this world. Online, are you listening to me? I didn't, am I still got online? Is online, did you check out already offline, no, overflow? Okay, now listen to this. Now why am I telling you this? Okay, because the times that we are headed for, I'm concerned about what's gonna happen to America, what's gonna happen to Hawaii, okay? God said, I'll bless those who bless you, I'll curse those who curse you. If you stand with Israel, to me, you're picking the right side. There's no other side. You wanna pick the Iran side? Good luck with that. I want to pick the side that, God, that I believe God's side is on. The Abrahamic covenant, it's a covenant he does not change. He doesn't change. So let me tell you what's, gosh, look at this. Okay, so now, look, look at this, this, this phrase that I love to say. Hard times create strong men. Hard times create strong. World War II brought strong men to the forefront. Strong men create good times. The good times was the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and 80s, and the 90s. Good times. Good times create weak men. Mm -hmm. And weak men create hard times. And we're living in that society. Uh, one, one of the great books that I read when I was uh, like 22 years old, 24 years old, 26 years old. Can I get a 28? Uh, 26 years old. And I was on staff with my pastor and he made us read these books. He made us read a lot of books. And one of these books he made us read and required that we would read is called The Fourth Turning. And I was like, why is this? It's not even a Christian book. Why am I even reading this book? And all of a sudden began to read this book and began to open up my mind and understand that we are in society goes through cycles. And the cycle that we are in is the fourth turning. And what happens with each turning, uh, according to Strauss and Howe, when I read this in my 20s, the, the, can I see the wheel, please? Can you put it up? There, right there. It said that society goes through a high. When it goes through a high, it's at its zenith. When it's at its zenith, then all of a sudden, People start to want to break free and they want an awakening. What's an awakening? Not the Christian awakening of people coming to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, but an awakening of rediscovery. Oh, we, have, we had all this restriction around us. And now the, the, the rules of the 40s and the 50s and the 60s is make love, not war. And then all of a sudden you got Woodstock, right? You have all of that. And, and then you got hate and Ashbury and people tripping out on acid and weed and everything else and LSD and in between and doing crazy stuff. I'm not going to even mention in this church building, but I'm, that's what happened. And then so that there was a, an awakening. The awakening actually begins to weaken society, and you have an unraveling. I believe right now we have an unraveling. There's an unraveling, but before the unraveling comes a crisis, or after the unraveling. Unraveling comes the crisis, and then when you have the crisis, these are things that are termed, sometimes they're termed, they're termed uh, black swan events. For example, September 11 changed everything. None of us expected September 11 to happen. We woke up in the morning, turned on our television, got a phone call, you need to see this, and we turned on the news, and we were shocked by what we were seeing, the Twin Towers on fire and eventually collapse. Let me give you another kind of event. Let's fast forward 20 years. August 8, 2023, the Lahaina fires. 
that caught all of us off guard. We couldn't believe that that was actually happened, and that took six hours, eight hours to actually go down. October 7, 2023, Hamas breaches the border of Gaza, Israel, changes their lives on both sides forever, and possibly even mine and yours. Let's look at another one. March 26, 2024, a tanker suddenly loses power. Weird. In Baltimore, and hits the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Coincidence? I don't know. Conspiracy? Possibly. But when you look at all of these different things, you begin to add them up, and you gotta go, what is going on in this world? Hello, 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 hello. Ricola. <laughs> I just wanna hear my echo. Think about this for a moment. When you begin to see the unraveling, you begin to see what's happening in society, when you begin to see the, the fragility of our society, what we begin to understand is now all of a sudden you have your world that is beginning or society that is beginning to crack at the foundation. But not only can society crack at the foundation, my life and your life can crack at the foundation as well. If it was never strong in the beginning or if it was built on faulty materials from the start, when the, when, when the winds come and the rains blow, that house may not stand. Let me tell you what Jesus said. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 to 27, he says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, everybody say practice, actually does it, they actually do it, actually puts them into practice, is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down. The streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Everybody say the rock. He had his foundation on the rock. The rock is Jesus Christ, everybody. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When you look at this, Jesus is not only talking about our own lives. I believe he's even mentioning a society that once used to follow him, that once believed that he was the foundation, the cornerstone of their country. But when you begin to take the Ten Commandments out of the courthouse, when you begin to put unjust judges in seats of power, when you begin to remove prayer from school in the 1960s, now all of a sudden you got teachers, not, not the, the forgive, forgive me, uh, for if you're in the education system, I'm not painting everybody with a broad brush, but when you're going to teach all kinds of different genders and, 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 and plurals and w pronouns, and what are we doing? And these guys want to kill us. We're weak. We can't be weak anymore. We have to stand up and be strong in Jesus' name. We have to be strong again in Jesus' name. It's the foundation. So when you have a fragile society or you have a person that can be fragile, let me tell you what begins to happen. When a catastrophic event happens in my life or your life, what are we building on? What are we building on? Is your life built on relationships? That guy or that girl, she leaves and you're going to fall apart? No. You will not fall apart. Because why? Because your life is built on Jesus. Can I get an amen? Okay? Listen to this. Listen to this. Look, look, look. Is it built on relationships? Is it built on good health? All right? Or financial success? I'm, building, I'm trying to build it on all of these things, but I can tell you this. At the end of the day, those things will not stand. Eventually, I'll get older. Eventually, I'll get older. I know I don't look it, but eventually, I'll get older. Anyway, moving right along. I do. Uh, is, is it built on your reputation that could be torn apart by someone else? Is it built on cultural identity that you put your trust in that? Is it built on trust in the government to save, to provide? Uh, or what are you putting your weight on? Who are you trusting in? When a catastrophic event occurs in your life, a breakup, a divorce, the death of a loved one, a seemingly incurable diagnosis, the loss of income, the loss of home, what is your rock? Who is your rock? Your rock has to be Jesus. Your rock has to be Jesus. Because if it is not, you will be disappointed and disenchanted with God and with church. You're going to say, it didn't work. You're going to say, I put everything into it. It didn't work. You're going to say, like, I tried God. God doesn't work. I tried church. It didn't work for me. I didn't work for me. But you know what? You can't try God. You can't try God. You have to, you, got, you, you can't try him. He's not, he, you can't try God. He's not like a, like a joint or something. I want to try a, I want to smoke a, a joint. I want to try that. 
No, you can't try God. You got to put everything into him because he's put everything into you. Yes, this is, I believe it. So now, now when you realize that you're going through a time of crisis or an unraveling, your life is unraveling, you're hitting a crisis, and when that begins to happen, what you understand is that the reason why you're going through what you're going through isn't so God can destroy you. It's to strengthen you. It is to strengthen you. Jesus said, in this life you will have much tribulation, and it's not caused by him, but he will allow you to go through a test. He'll allow you to go through the trials. I talked about the temptations, and I can tell you all of these things, because why? Because God is into building disciples, followers of him, who are not fickle, who are not like sand. Come on, somebody. He's looking for people like rock. He's not looking for a person that is sandy. He's looking for a person called rocky. Can I get an amen? So when I began to look at this, and I began, uh, like, uh, my, my relationship with Christ, when I first gave my life to the Lord, uh, was, you all hear the 21-year-old story that Michael Kyle was 21, um, brokenhearted, homicidal, wanted to hurt somebody, hurt somebody else, take my own life possibly, considered it for a little bit. Thank God that I didn't. And don't do it too. Don't even give it a thought. The devil is a liar, everybody. He's stealing too many lives. He's stealing them. Don't let him have it. Don't let him have it. You got your eternal security in God, but I'm telling you, don't give it up. Don't look. Too many people need you. I just want to say this. I said it last week. We are counting on you. There's another generation coming after you. Your hurt is only temporary. It is not a permanent hurt. You'll get over it. I did. Look at my life. Look at my wife. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Honey, stand up. No, no. Man, I tell you what. She's my Asian persuasion. Before there was Asian Dayton, Asian Hayton, I was Asian Dayton. And I'm telling you this, and I thought it was the end of the world, and sometimes you, some of you in this room, you think it's the end of the world. You think that nobody will have you, you'll never find love again. And you're, and you're, and you're only like 19, give me a break. <laughs> give me a break. You ain't even your best self yet. You're 19. I want to tell you, you're not even that great yet. Wait till you hit your 30s. Let me give you a goal of your 50s. Think about this for a moment. That your life is so critical to be lived by faith and trust in God that if you, if you ever think that, you, that nobody will have you and that you aren't worth it and, that no, and you're not good looking, you're not this, whatever, hey, give it some time, everybody. Every ugly duckling eventually turns into a swan. I couldn't get a girlfriend in high school. I tried, but they were all taken. They were all taken. All the good ones were taken. It was a small school, so there wasn't a lot. And, uh, but they were, they were there, but they were all taken. They were already taken. And so, believe it or not, little Michael Kai was on the shelf for a long time. <laughs> and then thank God I met Jesus because here's what happens. Here's what happens. I built, what, what are you building on? I built, don't build your life on this. Don't build it on all the other things, but I built it on love and I built it on lust. I built it on love, I built it on lust. I don't know, I'm not sure which one came first, but I'm telling you, I built, there's a joke right there, but I built it on the wrong stuff. Then I tried to build on top of that. Then I tried to build something solid on top of that, on top of that, on top of that. Then all of a sudden it came crashing down because it takes two people. And it crashed, and it crashed, and my world crashed. And my world crashed at the age of 21. It cra no, it crashed around at 20. Crashed. And I, think, I thought that, I don't know, what was my foundation? My foundation, I didn't have much. It was wood, stubble, and hay, the Bible says. Wood, stubble, and and hey, some of you are wood, stubble, and hey, <laughs> hey. <laughs> that was funny. You got to admit it. My daughter's not abused. <laughs> and when I began to realize that I was building on the wrong materials and I was building on the wrong things and the wrong stuff, and when I gave my life to the Lord, and then that's why I never got enchanted with, with God anymore. I never got enchanted with church. I was 17 years old when I first heard the gospel. Crazy, I grew up in, in, in the 
kind of church that I grew up in, nothing like this. And I thank God for the foundation, but I'd not, there wasn't that much of a foundation because it was here and nothing happened here. And I didn't know about being born again. And when I was 17 years old at the University of Hawaii, you're like, 17? You were young when you went to college. Yeah, I know it's advanced, but anyway, moving right along. <laughs> and so when I get there, I was smart, but I didn't have common sense. And when I finally get there, here's what happens. My friends show me the four spiritual laws. And they tell me God has a plan for your life and loves you. And thank God for Bill Bright and Campus Crusade for Christ because they were very instrumental. But I tell you what, my life, my seed, that seed happened and it fell on the wrong soil. There was not, it wasn't hard. It was a hard soil. It fell in the rocky soil, fell through the thorny soil, the thorny path. And all of a sudden the enemy came and stole it within like one week, stole that word away from me. And then four years later, I end up at church for the very first time. And from that moment on, I learned what it meant to build my life on the rock. That's why I love that song. Rain came, wind blew, my life was built on you. That's the, that's the deal. That's the deal. When you build your life on Jesus, he changes your life forever. He changes it forever. But now what you're wondering is why am I going through a tough time? I gave my life to the Lord. Let me give you, go, go to Judges chapter 3 with me, please. Judges chapter 3. And as you're turning there to Judges chapter 3, you know the book of Judges is considered, it's right before the book of 1 Samuel. And it's considered one of the biggest phrases that you'll find. It's right after the book of Joshua. I know turn there. Everybody got a Bible? Everybody got a Bible? Are we all, yeah, are you relying on your neighbor? Anyway, moving right along. Judges chapter 3. Judges chapter 3 verse, um, verse 1 says, well, before I even tell you what verse 1 says, the characterization of the time of the book of Judges was, in those days, Israel had no king. So everyone did what was right in their own eyes. It was an unraveling headed for a crisis. They were going through their own turning. It's a cycle. In Israel, there was a cycle. And the cycle was that they gave up on God, they looked to themselves, then they looked to other neighboring nation gods and wanted to do what they were doing, began to worship other gods, then God puts them under oppression. And while they're under the oppression by an enemy, because God will do that, because he disciplines those that he loves. And if you're being disciplined by the Lord, it means that he loves you. And he's trying to get your attention to get you back. He's trying to get America's attention for a long time, trying to get us back, okay? So when he does that, in those days Israel had no king and everyone did seem what would seem right in their own eyes. Judges chapter 3 verse 1 says this. It says, I'm reading it in my 14 font. You got it up there? Just put it up there. Help me out. Let me help a brother out. I'm, 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 I'm having a hard time up here. I'm struggling up here. And you guys are just watching me. Anyway, just kidding. Just kidding. Judges chapter 3 verse 1 says, These are the nations the Lord left to test Look at that. To test all those Israelites who had not experienced any of the wars in Canaan. Their mom and dad, well, the dads did, their uncles did, their grandfathers did with Joshua. But now Joshua dies, and now it's the period of the judges, and they're not able to fight. So he leaves the neighboring nations, a little bit of them, in there to develop some anti-fragility. Make them stronger. Verse 2. He did this only to teach warfare to the descendants of the Israelites who had not had previous battle experience. Why would God make it a little bit harder for you? Why would he make it a little bit more challenging for you? Why, would, why, why do your parents want you to do your chores? Why do they want you to go get another job? Why do they want you to get a summer job? Why do they want you to not take anything for granted? Why you got to get every, everything that you want? Why? Why? So you're not entitled. I'm not, I'm not mad at you guys, just so, you, if you're under, so you're not entitled, and you know what hard work ta takes, and you know what it takes to produce a dollar. So that way you're stronger. You're stronger. Not everything's given to you, although a lot's given to you in this generation, a lot. Okay? You can't earn your own cell phone. That's like 1,200 bucks or 800 bucks. That's hard to do, right? Well, some of you can if you're under 16, if you get an NIL contract. And anyway, moving right along. <laughs> But listen to me, listen to me. God allowed the testing to make them stronger. I'm going to preach to this side. This side is quiet. <laughs> Hi, guys. I'm Mike, your friend and your pastor. Just show me some love. I'm just kidding. God allows the testings. And within the long period of testings, I said this yesterday, last week. I'm going to say it a different way. There's trials and temptations, and the whole thing's a long test. 
Let me prove it to you. Joshua. No, not Joshua. Joseph. Joseph was thrown into the pit by his brothers because they were jealous of him because he had the call of God in his life. They throw him into the pit. Ishmaelite trainer, tra um, uh, traders come along. They sell him to the Ishmaelites. The Ishmaelites take him, and they human traffic him and sell him to Potiphar of the Egyptians, who's the head jailer and the number three guy in the whole country, according to some biblical scholars. Now, all of a sudden, he's serving in Potiphar's house. Everything that he does turns into gold. Potiphar cannot believe this guy. Everything from his dry cleaning to his car washing, everything is taken care of. Joseph has got it down. And he said, you can have anything. And then now, all of a sudden, Joseph, I mean, uh, Potiphar apparently has a very voluptuous wife, but some, she's got a problem. So now, all of a sudden, she throws herself at Joseph. Joseph, all over, throws herself. Anyway, and now just trying to entice him. Sorry. I'm, anyway, he's trying to, trying, to, <laughs> trying to entice him. Like, like, Joseph, do you like what you see, Joseph? I'm, I'm toning it down. I'm toning it down on purpose, Joseph. And then Joseph says, no, I can't have that. That's my master's. She is my, you are my master's. And no, and I, I would sin against God. He actually says that. How would I, why would I sin against God? And he runs away from her. Then all of a sudden she says, you know, calls human resources and says, he's harassing me. And he wasn't. It was worse than that. It was worse than that. I'm just, there's kids in here. He's harassing me. And the HR says, throw him in prison. The human resource manager says, you've got to go to prison. Now he goes to prison. And while he's there, now all of a sudden, you know, OSHA shows up. And OSHA says, yo, what's, what you doing over here? And he goes, oh, I'm going to throw a, I'm a butler and a baker at you. And the butler and the baker show up. And now, now through this long test, he's been tempted by Potiphar's wife. He's been falsely accused of doing something he never did. He's got trials. But the whole thing is one long test. <coughs> And while he's going through this one long test, and some of you are going through a testing right now, you got trials and temptations, and you, this is all coming down at you. You're going, why? I'm trying God, and I don't even want to go to church anymore. Because why? Because the testing of the trial and the temptation that you are under is setting you up for the day, listen to this, that you can interpret dreams and visions like nobody else you're going to see the way nobody else sees it. You're going to have hindsight and insight like nobody else has. No degree gave it to you. It's because you heard from God and you kept your integrity because you built your life on the rock. And there are times and the worship team can come up, and I'm not mad. I'm just passionate. And I've been up since 4 o'clock this morning. I'm spitting all over this stage. That's why they, they don't put an extra roll there. Now I understand why they wanted plexiglass during COVID. Anyway, moving right along. <laughs> Crazy. And I think about this. I think, what are you building your life on? You're brand new Christian. Or you're younger. Or you've got a little bit of, you got a little bit of wood, stubble, hay mixed up with rock and a little bit of cement in the sand. It's, it, it, you got a little bit of rock, good amount of rock, wood, stubble, hay, sand. That's still weak, guys. That's still weak. One catastrophic event, one black swan event, stuff you're not ready for, stuff you don't think, don't think worst case scenario. I do, by the way, I do. I'm, I'm a man of faith. I am, but I also think worst case scenario. Why? Because there's worse stuff in the Bible. Bad stuff happened in there to Israel. There's stuff in the book of Revelation that you should read. God's on our side, though. He's on our side. He's fighting for us. We got to be like the intercessors of Reese Howell. I told you about him. Reese Howell from Great Britain during World War II created a place where man people would intercede and pray like a retreat center he would train them in conservative christian thought theology while great britain was being blitzkrieged and bombed like nobody's business by hitler they prayed his intercessors they prayed and they prayed that god would move on their country's behalf Oh, they got cracks. They, oh, they got, they, they, a lot of people lost their lives. A lot of people perished. It's war. A lot of people perished. 
but Hitler could have had Great Britain and he did not succeed and Winston Churchill was heard quoted by saying and one of the things he says so much right has been has been won because of so few and it has later been said that he counted Reese Howells as one of his friends that was an intercessor that prayed for God not to just save the king or save the queen but to save the country and I believe that we're in a season that the church not the pastors but the church you're the church we're the church we are the church together living stones we're all living stones it's not dead stones these are living stones it's that we the church can pray and we can intercede for the islands we can pray for our military we can pray for our loved ones we can pray for the United States of America we can pray for the people in the Middle East region who are going through it like crazy can you imagine living in Jordan or Iraq and all of a sudden you've got missiles coming over your country and you've got drones flying over can you imagine also being a Christian in a place that's getting bombed and you're a Christian but your government is everything but and you're part of the crossfire can you imagine what that would be like you have to and so here we go are you ready are you ready to join up in the inspired church intercessory prayer team not not that one that one take a class for that and I love those guys you can do that one but will you pray for our country to come back to Jesus turn to God would you pray for a de-escalation of the war in the Middle East I know it's inevitable I read my Bible I read the book of Revelation look at book of Daniel can we pray for de-escalation I know somebody oh Jesus coming back sooner brah my like, brah I know but I still like seeing my grandkids you know what I mean one of them really needs Jesus he only seven but he needs Jesus all right this is stopped already Mike okay would you just stand right where you are would you just stand right where you are come on let's pray let's pray let's pray let's pray Lord we just stay with me stay with me don't leave Lord we pray for America right now Father, we pray that you shed your grace on thee. God, we pray, Lord, and no matter what the leadership is doing right now, Father, you could, you could even circumvent that. You could even use it, Lord God. You would be able to use that, Lord God, that you'd be able to turn the tide of Americans, God, turning to you. God, I pray that you protect our borders, you protect the people. Uh, Father, I pray that you protect us from any threat from the inside and the threat that comes from the outside. Father, we pray, Lord God, for the Pacific Rim. We pray against any attack that the... <clears throat> that the PRC would throw against Taiwan. God, we pray against any kind of war that's continuing to go on in Iran and in Israel and all the neighboring nations. God, we pray for our brothers and sisters who are standing guard in the, in the, in, in the Mediterranean and in the, in, in, in the different regions, the different seas, Saudi Arabia, the Indian Ocean, all of that, Lord God, that you'd protect our people, Lord God, that you'd protect this country. God, I pray that you show us mercy, God. I pray that you withhold things, Lord God. I pray, Lord, that there'd be a revival coming across the world in America like the world has never seen before, Lord God, so that you would bring in an end time harvest that would be so amazing, so powerful, Lord God, that the world would write, that, that, that it would eclipse, eclipse anything that the world has ever seen you do in the world, Lord God. So we love you, we bless you, we pray, we ask your touch upon this nation but me God I'm jealous for these islands I'm jealous for these islands Lord God the people of these islands everybody that's currently living here Lord God Father I pray they'd find you I pray they come to church any church any good Bible preaching church Lord God I pray that they enter into those doors Father I pray that you teach my church and our church to become the church Lord that it, that we would go out Lord God we take the revival in the building and take it outside Lord God and people would come to know you as Lord and Savior there'd be healings there would be miracles God cancer would be healed in the name of Jesus Lord God diabetes would be healed in Jesus name there'd be no more mental illness Lord God you'd bring healing to people's emotions and their minds in the name of Jesus Lord pour out your presence let a cloud of your glory 
cover them, blanket these islands, in one way hide us, and in another way, Lord God, that people would want to come to Hawaii. It wouldn't be ecotourism, it wouldn't be just tourism, it'd be because of the glory of God is on the islands, and they just want to come and experience your presence here, Lord God. So Father, we thank you. We give you the praise, the glory, the honor, in the name of Jesus, and everybody said, amen. Keep your eyes closed and your heads bowed just for a moment. If, and today, you know, it would be the perfect day if you were to give your life to the Lord or rededicate your life to the Lord and build it on solid rock and foundation and not on relationship or love or, or lust or whatever it is that you would, for achievement, reputation, all that's good stuff, man. That's good stuff, but you can't build life on that. You build it on the rock. And all these things shall be added unto you. Build your life on the rock and all these things that shall be added unto you. All the things you've been looking for. All the things that you've been desiring. All the things that you were hoping for. If it's God's plan, let him, let, let him build it on that. Let him, and all these things shall be added unto you. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's a verse. And all these things shall be added unto you. God added unto you. Let him add it unto your life. But if today, if you want to give your life to Jesus, like... So many people do every single weekend. Overflow, online, in person, right here in White Kelly. That's you at the count of three. I want you to shoot your hand in the air. And I don't want you to worry about nobody else. This is between you and God. This is between you and God. I want you to shoot in the air. And why? Because I want to count you. I want to be able to count. Because Jesus counted too. He left 99 to go after one. So you have to go 97, 98, 99. So one's missing. Maybe you're the one. And today you're the one. You're coming home today. Maybe, maybe you're returning. You, were, you left and now you're back. Maybe this is your first time coming back all the way. Get ready to raise your hand. He wants to forgive you of your sins. He wants to save you. He wants to come into your life. He, you must be born again, the Bible says. You have to be born again. Born once from your mom. Now you got to be born of the Spirit. Get ready for a new life. Get ready for a new purpose. But get ready for forgiveness. Get ready to meet your God. He's your Savior. Get ready to meet your Heavenly Father. Here we go, one. Get ready to raise your hand at the count of three. I'm going to go one, two, three. When you hear me clap at the count of three, I want you to throw your hand in the air. Get ready. Here we go, one. He will never let you down. Two, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Here we go, one, two, three. Put your hand up if that's you. It says, Mike, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me. God. Hi, hi, hi. One, two, three, four, four. Amen. Five, six, seven, eight. God bless you. Nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Amen. Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. God bless you. Sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, forty, forty-one. 41, keep them going. 42 right there. 43, 44, 45. God bless you. 46 right here. 47, 48, 49, 49, 50. 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60. 61 right there. 62. 63 at the top. 64 right next to you. 65, 66. Keep them up. Keep them up. It's almost done. 67, 68, 69. The, I know it's burning. 70, 71, 72, 73, 74. 75, 76, 77, 77, 77. There's about 80 hands and 11 in overflow. So there's 91 minimum, 91. Put your hands down. You're good. Come on, everybody. Come on. Especially the 91 people that just raised their hand. Would you just repeat after me? And especially the church. Say, Jesus. Today, I surrender and give you my life. Thank you for forgiving me of all of my sins and casting them into the sea of forgetfulness, never to be remembered again. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far you've removed my sin. Thank you for loving me before I first loved you. And I thank you that when I die, I win. Victory is mine. Because of what you did on the cross, I'll be in your presence for all eternity. But while I'm here, be my strength for today. 
hope for tomorrow. My ever-present help in my time of need. You're my God. I'm your child. The old is past. The new has begun. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus created to serve you and to bring you glory. So mold me, shape me, lead me, guide me, heal me, fill me, use me, and send me to fulfill your call on my life. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, Amen. Come on, can you thank the Lord, everybody?